welcome to the THC Show. My name is Neil Magnuson and I'm your host and uh, we'll be talking today about uh, THC, in this case truth, hope and change. Three important things to have in this world. Uh, on the show today we'll have 8 out of 10 Glenn from Canamatch.ca join us for the 420 moment session. And we'll have Jerry Martin join us for the Jerry Martin uh, Minute. And uh, we'll be at the Healing Wave CSPRV for an update on what's going on with our quest for a community-based uh, low barrier access cannabis store. And we'll also check in with the other CSPs and see what they're doing as well. Um, many people are not okay. How are you doing? Are you okay? Many people are not okay. There's lots of reasons for not being okay. There's lots of ways to not be okay. Life is hard. Life is harder for some than others. We don't really know what it's like for anybody else other than ourselves because we're not in their shoes 24-7. But for many people, life is a struggle. I think that as a society, we should just understand that. And that we should be tolerant and understanding that there's people out there, many of them, that struggle in their lives. The struggles can be very, very real and very difficult. Some people uh, go through incredibly tough times uh, as children, as young adults, and as adults. Uh, many people are traumatized by some singular event that happens in their life that they can't ever let go of. Uh, there's bad car accidents, there's rapes, there's numerous things that affect people. Life is not easy to begin with. Uh, if you're not born with all the right skills or potential for skills. Uh, if, you're, if you're not uh, quite as bright as the next person, you don't get that job or you don't get that opportunity or you don't get to even figure out how to feed yourself. Once you uh, are put out into the world after your, your, your youth experience, many people find that really, really hard to cope. Uh, in our world here in Vancouver, it's very difficult to find a job. The cost of living is really high. Uh, there's a lot of pitfalls involved along the way for young people growing up. There's a lot of uh, a lot of ways that people can get sidetracked into situations that become very problematic for them. And the point is, is that this is all part of society. This is all part of life. This is this is what it's like to be human at this time in our world. And the point of that is, is that we need to be understanding and tolerant of people, and we need to allow people to make their own choices for what they do to try to cope. Sure, of course, we can try to help people as best we can. We can provide the right strategies for people. We can educate people. We can have services for people. We can do all kinds of things. And we do and we should. Because a society is basically judged on how well it looks after those that are less fortunate and less able to keep up with the rest. So, all the point of this is, is the government has no business in the role of deciding what a person can and cannot ingest to try to deal with their issues. The idea that there could be drug prohibition is ludicrous. There is no person in the world that has the ability to prohibit what you decide to consume and put into your body. That's your business. Nobody else can make that decision for you and nobody else should judge you on that decision. Your friends and your family can give you feedback and you'll get feedback yourself on whether or not your strategy is working. Whether or not this is the right course to try to deal with what you have to deal with. But for governments to come along and say, oh, no, 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 you can't even try those things. Those things are too dangerous. But you can have alcohol. You can drown your sorrows with that. Or you can get on prescription medication that's really toxic and potentially dangerous to try to deal with your stuff and doctors will let you have that and a bunch of that stuff you can even get just over the counter but when it comes to cannabis government telling you you can't have that this is all nothing more than an, than an attempt to control people and to control what they consume so that they can have a piece of the pie this whole idea that you can deal with your problems or at least help your problems by consuming herbal medicine that you can grow yourself and the government doesn't get a cut of is just not acceptable to the people that think they own our asses. They want to be the ones supplying whatever it is that we consume and they want to make a profit on us. And the thought that people could just 
grow a plant in their garden or in their living room or wherever and not then spend money on pharmaceutical drugs, alcohol, other things that these people want to make money off us for to deal with our stuff. That's just not acceptable to the people that are our owners. Uh, I say our owners because that's how they act. That's how they treat us. That's the way this world is. That uh, for some reason we aren't free. We're told we're free. Uh, a lot of lip service is paid to that. Uh, we call it a free country. But we are certainly not free. If you're not free to grow a plant, harvest that plant, and consume that plant because you think it might make you feel better, and then there's somebody there that's going to tell you you can't do that, and they're willing to point a gun at you to stop you, they're willing to tie you up and cage you, they're going to steal your stuff, they're going to seize your properties, they're going to do all these things because you would dare have something to do with this plant that the owners have decided is not something they want you to have access to. Well, if that's the case, then we are certainly far, far from free. And being far from free causes a lot of problems for people. People react badly when they feel they're not free. They do all kinds of destructive things. There's people that are hiding behind dumpsters, shooting needles in their arms right now, just because they need to say, screw you, to those people who say they can't do that. And that's the only reason they're doing it. I drank alcohol from the time I was like 14 years old until I was old enough to drink, simply because I wasn't allowed to. It really wasn't about how much fun I was having getting drunk, because most of that wasn't very much fun. I was throwing up a lot, and I was waking up on people's front lawns in the morning with you know, stiff necks and sore backs, and I hurt myself lots of times. I tried to climb, I did climb a chain link fence, or a, not, not a, cha yeah, a chain link fence that had not barbed wire on the top, just the, just the sharp spikes, but oh man, I cut my hands all up. We were going skinny dipping in the, in the pool in the park, but we were all really drunk. Then, I, then there was a time I decided to play baseball with my bike when I was really drunk. And, and zoom around the bases, sliding in there. Well, I scraped my knee up and my legs up, and I got home drunk. And So I'm saying that, you know, it just screws people up to tell them they're not free. And the government shouldn't be doing that. And I don't know how they ever got to a position where they, they were allowed to do that. It started in the States. It started in, in, uh, with the prohibition of alcohol in 1923, where because it was going to interfere with the profits of the Rockefellers' fuel investments, they coerced a bunch of women with a bunch of lies to go to Congress and demand that they prohibit alcohol. It wasn't because there was violence due to alcohol, although that was the reason given, and Congress was already primed to go along with it because the Rockefellers had them in their pockets at the time, and so they prohibited alcohol. And like I say, it wasn't because people were getting drunk. It was because the Rockefellers wanted to make a bunch of money on fossil fuels. That was the main reason for it. Of course, it didn't stop the use of alcohol. That's what I'm saying. You can't, you can't prevent a person from doing something by telling them not to do it. In fact, what you end up doing when you do that is you coerce them into doing it. Most people would, that have any type of an intact spirit are going to take bullying by somebody else as a... As a uh, a cue to do exactly what it is that that person doesn't want you to do because that's how you end up feeling free that's what teenagers do they do everything they're not supposed to do because therein lies their freedom in their minds so adults should not be treated like children they should not be restricted from their choices unless they're hurting other people if you're doing significant damage to somebody else that's an issue and that's something that everybody has not just a right to do something about, but a responsibility. We all have a responsibility to prevent other people from damaging other people. But short of that, and yeah, maybe some property damage, you know, public property damage, we should not allow that to happen as well. I, I get that. That does kind of hurt people. But these other, these other, you know, end arounds of, you know, while well, you're, you're, drug use is hurting your family and therefore we're going to make you a criminal for hurting your family and we're going to treat you like a criminal. That doesn't fly. That doesn't wash. That's not the way things go. You as an individual get to do what you want to yourself. 
If your family is all concerned and upset because you've decided to take up skiing and they know that you could get injured because one of your family members spent months in the hospital and never walked again properly because they went skiing, they still don't have the ability to tell you not to go skiing. They do have the ability to warn you, to tell you to be careful, to maybe even provide you with safety equipment. Who knows what family and friends do for people that they love when they think they're in trouble? But that's where it ends. Family and friends, they get to help each other with those types of issues. Governments don't, well, shouldn't get to do that. Because when governments become the ones to tell you what you should and shouldn't do, everything gets skewed. Because governments don't care about you. In case you thought they did, I'm here to tell you, governments don't care about you. You can't trust them. They will, as soon as they can, they will sell you out. They, will, they sold you out before they become politicians, typically. They know what they're in it for. They're in it for themselves. Now, not all people. And i, I got to grant you that. There's some good people who get into politics. No doubt about it. But they never rise to the top. They never rise to the top because they're not corrupt or corruptible. Only the corruptible people get to be our leaders. Because that's the way our owners have insisted it be. They're not going to let somebody get into those positions of influence that are going to go against their wishes, serve the public interest at the expense of the corporations. No, they wouldn't have anything to do with that. So we have a system where the corporate elite, the financial elite, have access to our politicians, that they are able to participate in the election process, where they are able to finance campaigns, and they are able to get their way as a result at the expense of everyone else. So that's my rant. That's where we're at. That's what's not good about things. We need to have limited, accountable, transparent public servants who are keenly aware that their purpose in life, the reason that they're being paid our money, is to protect the individual sovereignty of every human being under their charge, that they are servants to us, that the last thing that they could do when given that particular position, is sell us out to corporate interests. And yet that's what's going on all the time. So people, I don't know what we do. I don't know how we do it. Uh, I don't know how you do it. This is how I do it. I hope we're all doing something about it. Uh, handing off this planet or this, this world that we have to the next generation in the shape that it's in would not be very nice of us. We need to spend a portion of our time, each and every one of us, doing something to ensure that the next generation is going to be able to survive and continue to move forward towards actual freedom and a governance system that involves people who are in servitude to all of us and keenly aware that every single human being is a unique sovereign individual. And as a sovereign individual, you have the right to access nature to ingest and consume whatever you want, to do whatever you need to do for yourself or want to do for yourself as long as it doesn't involve hurting other people. That's what we need. So I hope you can figure out ways to do it. Uh, I, I started out by helping at the, the pot rallies here in Vancouver when I first really started to become aware of, of how big a problem it was that now my 16-year-old son was also probably going to spend most of his life being a criminal and worrying about police and all of that kind of stuff because he had tried cannabis and he liked it like most people do. Many people when they try cannabis they they know right away this is something they're going to do again. Some people understand it's something they're going to want to be able to do their whole life. But in a world where it's illegal and the criminal law is used against it and armed policemen are going to apprehend you, put you before a, a judge that's going to put you in a cage and take away your properties, well, this is just completely wrong, and it really needs to stop. And so I hope that you can find ways to, to, to further this, this issue. Uh, I started going to the pot rallies uh, because they, were, they had put up posters back in 1999 saying that they were protesting the laws against cannabis, and it was right at that time when my 16-year-old son wanted to smoke weed with me, and I was all concerned because now he's going to be a criminal in this world. So we started going to these, these pot protests. That turned out to be, you know, a place where I started to get involved and got more and more involved. And then finally, 
I got asked by the fellow putting on the pot rallies if I'd be his business partner. I took that position. That resulted in me quitting my construction job that I'd been working at all my life, uh, opening up another uh, uh, dispensary. We called it the Vancouver School of Drug War History and Organic Cultivation, the Herb School for short. Three and a half years that place was open. I was there for 22 and a half months before, due to a vision that I had uh, along my way of trying to look into what's right and wrong, I, I had a, an actual spiritual vision where a brilliant bright white light zapped me right in the middle of my forehead. And I, without looking, wrote a whole bunch of stuff out. And when I read it, at the end of that experience, I was going to Ottawa to talk about freedom on Remembrance Day with the Prime Minister. And so that's what I ended up doing. I just followed what was right for me moment by moment uh, from the time I made a decision that I was going to do something about the state of the world and, and the state of, of cannabis laws. And I think you can do the same thing. I think that everybody has a different path, a different journey, a different flow. But if you make a decision that you're going to take a step in this one direction and you're going to try to make the world a better place for the future generations, then things happen. Opportunities present themselves. If you take those opportunities, you will find yourself on a path towards whatever it is your future is in helping to make the world a better place. It's a good place to be. It's unfortunate that the world is as messed up as it is. It's unfortunate that we have had our, our political situation so corrupted by financial influence that we have to work to make the world a better place. It would be nice if there wasn't a lot of greed or ways for greed to, to, to use its power against us and we could just live our lives and find all the things we enjoy and every day all day just run around doing all the things that we enjoy doing from the job that we choose to the family that we raise to all the entertaining and stuff. Oh, it's 419. Roll them if you got them. I got one more minute. It would be great if the world was like that, but it's not. It really isn't. And it's not going to get any better unless we make it better. Because those forces that have made it as corrupt as it is are still with us and they're not going anywhere soon. So all we can do is try to counter that as best we can. By helping to educate each other about what the truth of our situation is, what freedom really is, and working against those, those obvious policies that are hurting people, costing us a lot of money, and only there to enrich the greedy and the elite and that certainly would be cannabis prohibition so there we go it's uh, 420 uh, I'm not smoking today I'm taking a day off but uh, Glenn's here he's gonna smoke one for me as well yeah I'm gonna smoke twice as well you smoke twice as hard for me Glenn <laughs> I will I'll blow the smoke your way <laughs> maybe <laughs> no I won't even do that I guess you can do that <laughs> you can you smell me <laughs> it won't be too bad got a headache again well, I had a little bit of a headache yesterday in the yeah. evening at night time, and I took some pills to deal with that. Perfect. And uh, I just don't want to aggravate that situation. Oh, so. no problem. And and we, unless smoking weed was mandatory. It might be on the show, but you've done this before, so oh, we're okay with that. <laughs> I don't you've, believe yeah. smoking weed or, or ingesting cannabis should be mandatory for everyone at all. <laughs> no. Only for certain people. I have... I have a few friends. <laughs> Certain people, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a few friends that, uh, I have one friend that I believe, according to him, anyway, I wasn't there that day, although I'd been in court with him several times because he ends up in court several times. But uh, he tells me that, that one judge told him that he should continue to smoke cannabis. <laughs> and not drink. And not drink. And, and not, not drink. do meth. Yeah. And not do other things that was causing him to react violently. And uh, yeah, so some people should Did probably... Hmm? Did he listen to him? Oh yeah, he yeah. did. He continued to smoke weed and uh, and, and got uh, himself clean. Got himself clean. That's and he's good. Doing much much better. So, so that judge did a good thing. Well, I mean, he was going to keep smoking anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, it, it illustrated the point where I think that's a much better uh, um, judgment. Yes. To be given in court. Yeah. Then you know we're going to fine you. We're going to hurt you. We're going to punish you. Yeah. Uh, stigmatize you. No, no, we want you to be a better person. We want you to stop doing what you were doing there. I think if you start involving yourself with cannabinoids or if you up your cannabinoid intake, then that'll, uh, that'll be a good thing for society. Maybe I'm just dreaming. But I well, know that's it, true. You well, know? You it, know, it might sound silly. It, eventually but it we is could get there, right? We, we could. We could there, you know, you know they, they, they give mandatory vaccinations to people that are in prison. 
Yeah. Uh, when you get sentenced, a lot of times you have to take these vaccinations that are in there. Uh. Um, I think that they should uh, make it mandatory that they, they, they smoke, you know, they pour smoke out into yeah. the vent oh, systems yeah. or something like that. You know, cannabis smoke. Well, you know, like I used to do. Not it, but not everything. Okay, I did a lot of weekends in in Memico in Toronto, which is a minimum security place, and yeah. the, the the guards during the days and where regular population was would let people smoke pot. Really? They but they wouldn't because they realized that the guys were a lot calmer. Oh yeah. Their job was a lot easier if they were just turning their cheek and look in the other way, right? Yeah. But when they were making, uh, saving all their fruit and juice and making alcohol, there was a lot more problems, yeah. right? So they would go after those guys, right? right. So when you when they walked in and they smelled hash, because in Ontario it was just a lot of hash, right? But they would just look the other way, right? Because they realized it would make their job a lot easier. I'm sure most guards realize that people would be easier to deal with if they were using cannabis and that they're harder to deal with when they've been using alcohol or where they're just angry. And the government could cut their stuff in there. <laughs> the government could peddle their stuff in there, put it in the canteen. Right? That's, <laughs> no, that's that cruel be... and unusual punishment, Glenn. <laughs> but you're in jail. <laughs> Forcing people to use government? Well, you're in a government facility, right? Yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. you can be part of your canteen, right? You know, you It have, should be part of your, your canteen, canteen yeah. right? It should, be, it should be issued to you with the pills they make yeah, the cake. But now we have to worry about WorkSafe saying a smoky environment is not good for human beings, right? So now, now that's what their, their, their next comeback will be. Oh, well, we can't have that. But let's just put really good ventilation This systems. is all the result of the stigmatization that's been going on, the lies that have been told for, for decades and decades here. That cannabis makes you stupid, cannabis makes you lazy, yeah. uh, all of those things. I mean, you can you can smoke yourself into a stupor. Yeah, you can. You can use yeah. indicas that'll lock you to the couch. I've had, um, you know, we, there, it there's... Weed me out. Yeah, but at the <laughs> same time, I mean, many, many professional people use cannabis as a focusing tool, uh, myself included. Uh, I'm a better driver when I'm using yeah, cannabis because it, it dulls down the pain that I have from arthritis and things that, that, yeah. that is somewhat debilitating. Uh, and it's a focusing tool. Yeah. When I, and, and same on the job site for me. I worked in construction, and if I would have a few puffs at coffee time, I'd come out and get into that project, whatever yeah. the afternoon's project and was, and man, right into it, you know, so yeah. focused. Not not gazing around, wondering what I'm supposed to do, not forgetting shit, when, none of that stuff. When's quitting done? Yeah, none of that stuff, <laughs> yeah, you no, know. No, you I mean, that good. stuff comes if you smoke and too much. Co- yeah. You know, if you get outside of your, your normal usage, uh, perhaps you can be like that. But for me, at a coffee break, a few good puffs, and man, am I ever into my little project, you know, and, and just That's right true. into it. What happens to us? And not only that, driving. before you know it, the time has gone by, too. Yep. Before you know it, it's the end of the day and, and what happened. Yeah. So, uh, and, and I never had a serious accident on the job site. Uh, you know, I was one of the most efficient people on the site. I was usually the head guy on, on the sites. Uh, you know, I try to be a, a high-functioning human being. And if cannabis was making me not function highly... I would not have used it. I absolutely would not have used it. If it impaired me on the road, I absolutely, yeah. 100% would never use it. I'm no. not a fan of impaired driving. I think that when you're hurtling down the road in that 2,000 pound chunk of metal, that that's a weapon if you're if you're impaired and that that's deadly, yeah. you know, if it's not used properly. And that's so, the thing about alcohol is that when it gets you to the point where you don't think that you're impaired. Well, that's it. Right? Well, whereas alcohol pot, obviously is a difference. Pot, we, we know because we'll be sleeping on the couch instead of getting behind a wheel because we don't think we're impaired. Yeah. Right? We'll be sleeping it off, right? So, yeah, I have lots of friends who don't drive you know, after they've consumed cannabis. I have cannabis. to say the same thing for, like what Neil said, like, if you're just starting to smoke, don't drive. You know, yeah, we've, got 40, usage, we've yeah. got 40 years of smoking and, and, yeah. and, and, and driving. I've got 30 of, of it. But I'd say at least five years before you can at least start driving. I think everybody's different and, and I don't really know. Use, but, yeah. uh, you know, I, I do know that uh, a novice user should not start yes. out by smoking a joint and then going for a drive. That just makes sense. Because, yeah. uh, you know. And you, but, you're able to judge on, on marijuana and, and cannabis. Well, the you, thing with cannabis is, is it's impairing because yeah. it enhances your senses. All yeah. of a sudden, everything's a little brighter, the music's a little better, and everything. And, and it can be overwhelming, mm-hmm. and especially for a novice user who's not used to that. Yeah. So the thing with cannabis is you need to use it a few times to get used to what those sensations are, and then, and then adjust to those. Yeah. And, and then you you find out for yourself, am Start I capable of driving, am I not capable of driving? All right. Well, that's for animals. <laughs> well, that's going to be for pot too, man. It could be for I'm pot too, as to far as novice users go. Put me on my ass and asleep in the chair for a good hour. Yeah, right? novice <laughs> users, I guess, same thing. Start low, go slow. Yeah. Um, you don't need much usually when you're a novice user just to start out with, but uh, yeah. Yeah, um, feel your, you know, feel it out, right? 
novice users typically would be impaired and you can't take a chance that you wouldn't be impaired because you don't know because you're not a, a veteran user. So if you're, if you're not very familiar with how the effects of cannabis affect you personally, yeah. then uh, wait until you are before you decide to get into that 2,000 pound chunk of a weapon out there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But these are things that need to be worked out. That, yeah. You know, where these, the, the reefer madness, the lies, the stigmatization that's been going on for so long has resulted in, in, in these big corporations buying right into that, uh, accepting that, uh, you know, cannabis is a dangerous commodity and it, it, people are impaired by using it. And so, you know, you can't use it if you're working in the oil fields. Uh, lots of different uh, companies will test you for cannabis. You can work in the oil fields and do cocaine. It doesn't stay in your system long enough to show up on tests for yeah. one thing. They don't test for it anyway. You can drink alcohol if you're working in the oil fields. And many of these, just about any job you have, you can go out at the end of the day with your fellow co-workers. Yeah. You can hit a bar. You can stay till you close the place down. You can show up the next day all hung over. And, you know, you might get fired for not doing your job right. But you're not going to get fired because you went out and consumed alcohol. Yeah. Well, that might have been the cause. You're going to get fired for consuming cannabis. But consume cannabis and, and you know. One of our local commercials, uh, Super Safe, you know, the propane and, and garbage, yeah. they have an advertisement for their hiring people. A drug-free environment, they say, yeah. right? And I, I call them up on that. It's like, well, cannabis is legal, so how can you say a drug-free? Well, we don't want our drivers using the cannabis and coming to work. <laughs> I said, well, a cop can do it after eight hours, right? And, and drug-free. Drug-free. What the fuck does that mean? Yeah. Sorry, anybody. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, seriously, people use drugs for all kinds of things. If you got a headache, are you telling me you can't take a drug for your headache and go to work? I mean, would your employer rather have you there with a splitting headache? Than, she didn't like you know? very much. Shut up, man. Yeah, but it's just right, crazy. But yeah, yeah. Um, but what about if somebody was on opiates? Oh, well, they can't come to work? Well, I mean, in there it would depend on, on the level of opiates, on what you're yeah. using it for, and, it's and, it's, and whether it impairs yeah. or not, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But some people are on a, a maintenance of opioid medication that does not typically impair them, that yeah. allows them to Just function. Like cannabis doesn't impair you know? us while we're driving. That's right. I mean, yeah, uh, so they get to that level, right? So these, uh, these groups that have either bought into the stigma or they recognize that uh, the prohibition of cannabis is profiting the rich friends that they have, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. But uh, they've maintained these things throughout uh, the workplace and there's no real justification for it. Like I say, especially if, if you can go out and use alcohol and, and you're good to go, uh, then you should certainly be good to go out and use cannabis. Yeah. Uh, you know, the more ten times quicker quite. than than on using alcohol, yeah. but there again, it's really nobody's business. Uh, I ran uh, construction companies myself. I had my own company. I had fifteen guys working for me. Uh, they were fine to use cannabis on the job. They were fine to do whatever they wanted on the mm -hmm. job, as long as they got the job done. Yeah. As long as they were in the right, you know, in, in a proper frame of mind yeah. during the time that they were on site, and and that's up to them. And that should be up to everybody. If you're not doing your job right, if you're not living your life right, if you're not functioning properly, and, and that's because of substance use that's going on, well, then that's up to you as an individual to do something about. If you're not functioning properly in a workplace, well, unfortunately for you, it's up to your boss to determine what you, you, know, what you yeah. cannot do. But uh, as far as your own, t own personal time goes, as far as what you do as an individual, it really is nobody's business but yours. Um, it can be somewhat the business of your family, uh, you know, but only to a point, only to a point. Your family is not able to come and wrestle you to the ground and seize what you have, uh, you know, lock you in a room and, and you know, keep you there, uh, tell you you can't get a job, make you run around with a sign hanging from your neck saying you're a drug user. Your family can't do those things and they wouldn't do those things. That's not what helps people. That doesn't work. And, and it has maybe a slight chance of working if it's being done by people that actually care about you and love you, but it has zero chance of working when it's a corrupt government that's telling you that you can't do these things. Well, but you can do these other things. <laughs> You're fine to smoke commercial tobacco and join yeah. the... The, the seven or eight million people that die every 12 months from smoking tobacco or, or you're you're fine to go ahead and drink alcohol and be you know one of the few hundred people that die from alcohol poisoning just in this province not alone, not alone all the rest of the world uh, and all the other problems that come with alcohol you're fine to do all of that but you're not fine to use cannabis now <coughs> no it'll keep making you live longer <laughs> that's like you saying it right yeah. so you know <laughs> I got a show. This is how I'm trying to solve it. Uh, you guys do whatever you can do to try and solve it. Everybody yeah. do something, please, uh, you know, because we're all involved in this, uh, this thing called life on this planet, and uh, you're given a shot at life. You should take a portion of that and use it to try to pro provide the next generation with something worth inheriting from us, I would think. 
And, and not only that, it gives you a lot of pride and, and, and good feeling to be a contributor rather than a detractor. If, if, you're, if you're making the world a worse place, if you're running out there and you don't care and you're hurting people and you're rude to people and you're damaging shit, eh, how do you feel about yourself? Eh? Yeah, I, mean, I know. Really. Okay. You know you're a piece of shit, you know, maybe you got people to blame for that and you're doing that because you want to blame these people. Whatever it is, you don't feel great. Yeah. But trust me, if you volunteer a bit of your time to help other people that are in need, if you do something to try to make the world a better place for the next generation to inherit, it feels really good. It's a great way to spend your time because it enriches you and, and you know, you can do it out of selfishness if you mm -hmm. want. But uh, be unselfish out of selfishness. Well, thanks, Glenn. I appreciate yeah, that a lot. I just wanted to say about that Canamatch thing for the uh, Apple users. Right. Remember the last Canamatch week. .ca, we yeah. didn't talk about that at all. Yeah, right? it yeah. just, um, the Apple users, we have to wait a month or two mm -hmm. for the chameleon people who run my site uh, right. to update their program, and then we'll be able to get you on Apple. So okay. we are and what that is, is it's an app that you can get for yep. a dating site that's for cannabis-friendly people. And it's not just for dating, it's for hooking up with people that are like-minded with yeah. respect to cannabis use. Uh, it's a great resource if you're maybe in a new town and you don't know anybody and you want to know how to hook up without having to walk into a government store, which you should never want to do. Well, I don't know about never, maybe down the road somewhere. <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah. We can solve this yeah. issue if we have community-based, right like, barrier access we, we cannabis stores. Yeah. <laughs> but until that time, I wouldn't go to those stores. I wouldn't support them. And if the you're traveling place. and you need to find some medicine safely, Canamatch is a good spot to do that too instead of buying it from a guy on the corner. Canamatch.ca, and unless you're an Apple user, you can get an app on your phone. Yep. Very good. All right, thanks. thanks, Glenn. We'll Have a great week. week. Yep, Have as fun as you can. All right. All right. So this segment of the show is dedicated to Jerry Martin and, uh, and his plight uh, through the courts. Uh, Jerry Martin was a dispensary owner in a small town in Saskatchewan. That was uh, Once legalization happened, he was asked to uh, shut down his dispensary, which was the opposite of what was supposed to happen, the opposite of what he had expected to have happen. Uh, as a dispensary owner, you're dealing with uh, people that are not well, that are not able to easily access cannabis as medicine, and m for many of them, cannabis is the medicine that works for them, and no other really does. And uh, for those people who are really uh, stuck without being able to find proper sources for cannabis, and there, there's no other medicine that really works for them, well, having a local dispensary is an absolute godsend. And so even in small town Saskatchewan, when dispensaries were popping up all across Canada, uh, there were there were dispensaries, and in Whitewood, Saskatchewan, Jerry Martin had his dispensary there, Martin Medicinal Services, and uh, he ran that for four and a half years, and then legalization came in. Uh, he did it under strict medical protocols that had been designed uh, here in Vancouver for the Compassion Club by Riel Kapler and Philippe Lucas, and uh, tried to do everything that he thought the government would expect to be done so that he could be transitioned into the mainstream marketplace. Uh, Trudeau, in his lead up to his uh, successful uh, campaign, to, uh, going from a non-government, a non-status in, uh, in our federal parliament to a majority government on a platform of legalizing cannabis, had said in that in the lead up to that election that the medical users would be well served by the new legalization, that they wouldn't have to worry about anything. Uh, Jerry had heard Trudeau say something about the, the the gray area dispensaries keeping proper books and being transparent, and he did all of that, but in the end he was ordered to shut down. Uh, which he couldn't do, uh, and nobody could do that, and you couldn't expect him to do that, and how the government ever thought that a, a person running a dispensary, uh, helping people with their lives uh, profoundly, would be able to just stop doing that. Uh, that is cruel and unusual punishment for sure, to, to think that a person who's you know, been responsible, Jerry had over a thousand members in his dispensary, people coming from all over the place in Saskatchewan because they needed the service that he was offering. I know what it's like to run a dispensary. I, I had this herb school going, as I mentioned earlier in the show there, for 22 and a half months I worked there. And day after day, people would come in there and nearly bring us to tears with, with how thankful they were that we were there helping them get access to cannabis, uh, stories that would curl the hair on the back of your neck. And so that if, you're, if I was told to shut down at that point, uh, I certainly wouldn't have. And, and, and look how ridiculous this is. For four and a half years, you run an illegal dispensary where any day you stand the risk of being raided and arrested. And then four and a half years into it, the government comes and tells you that because legalization is coming, you have to shut down your dispensary, turn away the thousand or so people that are coming to get help from you. And not only would you not then have all these people coming and thanking you for what you're doing, then you would have a whole bunch of people coming to you begging you to continue to help them. Because what else are they going to do? 
And what are you going to do as a human being when this other human being who's suffering is begging you to continue helping them the way you have been for years? Are you going to say no to those people? Because now all of a sudden what you're, what you're doing is illegal? Well, just wait a second. What you were doing before this was always illegal. So nothing has changed. You're still illegal. You're still facing risk of raid. Uh, and you're going to now stop because nothing's changed? It's ludicrous. It's outrageous. It's absurd that the government would expect that to happen. So of course Jerry didn't shut down. Jerry is a human being with one of the biggest hearts I've ever seen. Not a chance he was going to say no to all those people. 100% he was going to keep on helping those people at the risk of his own liberty and property because a person with any type of a conscience, let alone the heart the size of Jerry's, could not turn those people down, would not stop doing what he was doing just because you're going to be illegal when you were still illegal in the first place. So of course he didn't stop. And yeah, he got arrested and he got his property seized and shut down and threatened. And that's been going on for over four and a half years. We're coming up to five years in November or January. Yeah. No, November. November. So, anyway, that's where we're at. Um, Jerry has had uh, numerous days in court to try to have a day in court. Over 40 appearances at our expense uh, to, to get that one day. And that one day wasn't in a courtroom, but it was, uh, you know, with a judge. It was with affidavits. It was with lawyers. And he did get to be cross-examined on his affidavit and answer all those questions. And, and now we're waiting for, oh, there's still some final submissions and decisions. And then there will be a decision by the judge, maybe by December is what we're looking at. But that's what we know. Anyway, Jerry's here, as always. And I should bring him on and let him talk for himself. Uh, come on in, Jerry. Slide on in here, my friend. How's it going? Okay, and you? Okay, yeah, I'm okay. Okay. Yeah. Still frustrated with uh, my situation? How are you with yours? Yeah, a little bit frustrated. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's been dragging on for a long, yeah. long time. Eh? It's getting to me. And it doesn't look like it's going to end anytime soon. I mean, uh, this particular court yeah. case may have a decision in December, yeah. but you're going to appeal if you lose, probably, right? No appeal. And they'll, they'll probably appeal know. if they lose. Yeah. I don't know, Jerry. I don't know if I can go through it again. Chin up, man. Yeah. I'll carry you through it. Yeah. I'll help you yeah. any way I can. We yeah. need you. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I mean, you can see now uh, how powerful this is. You know, uh, I've been telling you since, since you were first arrested that your case is going to be one of the most important cases that we brought before the courts. And you can see that that's the case. And, uh, this is about sick people. It's about poor right. people. It's about access to cannabis for people that aren't rich and that need it for medical purposes. And there's no bigger battle for us in this movement. Uh, we started with the medical people because they needed protection first. And it looks like we're going to have to bring them into, the, into, into this fight because they didn't get protected. Government comes along and instead of protecting the sick people that need cannabis, the ones that we decided to protect first as a, as a movement, they've let them just completely go to the white wayside. And it's horrible. So we have to fight them in the courts. And here's our government using our money to fight against Canadian people getting easy access to cannabis. That's disgusting. That is it disgusting. is a waste of money. Waste of time. Super Powerful. waste of money. To hurt people. The, the city of Vancouver did the same thing. Um, when, when they were taken to task on whether or not they had the power to regulate these dispensaries. And the federal government was there with a couple of high-paid lawyers. The provincial government was there with a couple of high-paid lawyers. The municipal government was there. There were six lawyers on the government side. All being paid for by taxpayers. All arguing against sick people's right to have a storefront to go into and get cannabis. Disgusting, disgusting, disgusting. Like the Trudeau government spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to prevent some native child from getting med a medical procedure yeah. that, was, that would only yeah. cost a few thousand dollars. Yeah. This is what type of a world yeah. we're living in. This is why I have to do what I'm doing even though it bothers the hell out of me and I just want to go fishing in my old age. This world is totally corrupt and upside down. On, on Reconciliation Day, I have to say that. We all know it is. So, um, can we? Is there still a publication ban? I didn't get to listen yeah, to on the yeah, last thing. So yeah, still a publication so, yeah. ban. We really can't tell you what's gone on there. Uh, it'll all come out hopefully within a little while because uh, what's the dates we're looking at now? It's November fifth and then the sixteenth and seventeenth. Okay, and 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 then the seventeenth. That should be the end of it, and then the judge will make a decision. I don't know. Well, that's what they say so far, but that's as we found yeah. out, that's subject to change every time, right? Yeah. So unless they add more dates to do more things down the road, that November 17th should be the end of it. 
And then the judge has said, I heard her say, that she was going to try to do this quickly. Mm. That she was going to take what yes. time she had leading up to it to get up to speed. Yeah. And that it should be a fairly quick decision. So probably by early December, we'll have at least a decision on that. And then, like I say, there may be appeals. There's probably appeals. I don't know. But, uh, but yeah. So I'm kind of frustrated, too. Uh, for us, it's been uh, over a year since we applied to the federal health minister for a temporary exemption from the Cannabis Act to allow us to just continue what we'd been doing at that point for a long time without hurting anybody and helping a lot of people, and we're still waiting. Uh, also, we applied for licenses to Health Canada at the same time. Yeah, they don't, um, they don't move at all. Uh, they told Health Canada in a, in a conference call with myself and, and my lawyer, John Conroy, who's done such a fantastic job for us, uh, said that uh, they figured early January. Remember that one? Yeah. Yeah, they said that we yeah. should have it done for you. They yeah. said because of COVID and the yeah. Christmas holidays, uh, you know, yeah. we should have it done by early January. Yeah. Where are we now? We're, October, uh, we're late, September. <laughs> late yeah. September. They to be to be fair, they didn't specify which January. Yeah. You know, yeah, we we January. assumed it would be the following yeah. day, you know. But yeah, I just I, yeah. I was we were naive on That's that. Good. One. <laughs> <laughs> January. If I if I confront Mr. Benoit Seguin with that, he's going to say, "Well, what oh, did you, you really thought it would be this January? Do you not understand how we work here yeah. or don't work here?" You know, he told me in the last message he sent now, it's about a month and a half ago, that, uh, rest assured, our team is working diligently on your submission yeah, every day yeah, since yeah. we got it, he said. He yeah, didn't say it in a French day. accent, but I know he has one, because we had the conference call. Every day. <laughs> every day. Every day. Diligently. Diligently. <laughs> <laughs> that is good, eh? John Conroy and yeah. I, we worked on it every day yeah. diligently yeah. for about a month, yeah. you know? And uh, it took us a while to put all that together, but we yeah. did it in a very comprehensive way. Yeah. We laid it all out really easy to digest. We made it so that it wouldn't take, yeah. you know, very long to look at that, you know. Yeah. Uh, we thought that average intelligent people, maybe a week later, would have gone through that application he properly. He job from his cousin. Yeah, I guess, eh? <laughs> Uh, he must have gone through a screening process, yeah. and, and and he was determined yeah. to be the one that could most stand up against pressure yeah. to allow for cannabis to be sold yeah. cheaper than what the government wants to sell it for. Yeah. And that seems to be his entire job description in the, in the Special Licensing and Exemptions Department of Health Canada, yeah. Mr. Benoit Seguin. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you must know it, him or you get it, nothing. Is, is, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, his job obviously is not yeah. to, uh, in a timely fashion, allow for... Uh, valid applicants to They're receive reasons. They're the most stringent over there in Quebec, too. Uh, it's just the most stringent. They didn't allow any home growing for people. So you in yeah. Quebec, you can't even grow your four plants. Mm. That was challenged. That was defeated. Mm. But it was appealed. Yeah. And the appellate court upheld the oh. growing ban. Yeah. Somehow, the courts think that it's okay for yeah. public servants to tell the yeah. public that we can't grow some medicinal plants. Yeah. Oh, it's so corrupt. It is corrupt. So corrupt. Meanwhile, what else do I have? I got uh, Marines are battling to have medical cannabis available to vets for PTSD. Imagine that. You're a soldier. Yeah. You, you're given a gun you're, yeah. and, and grenades and shit, and you're told to go kill people. Yeah. And, and then you're all messed up because of that. Yeah. You come back. and all You can't you have any weed. You can't have any weed because we'll that shit's dangerous, prison. man. And you got to go to one of their prisons, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just way worse, apparently. It's horrible. It's worse, man. The, the, the U.S. military has people in jail yeah. for consuming cannabis. Insanity. Yeah, that fought for their country. Insanity. Yeah. Too dangerous for the soldiers to yeah. be involved with. Yeah. Too, too scary for soldiers to be able to make a decision on their yeah. own about whether they think yeah. that cannabis might help them and that they was, want to try it. seems to be a big one with the Navy and the Army. I'm always getting the alerts, eh? Oh, yeah? Yeah. And, and a big way in what sense? That well, they're, they're always getting busted. They're getting busted for it. Yeah, them. yeah. So in that, in that case, the, the soldiers yeah. obviously are continuing to want to use it. Yeah. But their yeah. government decides it's too dangerous for them. You go to war, but uh, you, can't, you can't have a trip on some drugs. Well... So that, that, by the way, that, that, that growing ban uh, is still being challenged again. Uh, and now they've joined forces with people from Manitoba who are also, because in Manitoba, they also are, 
are so strict there, you can't grow fucking plants. Oh man, I can't yeah. stand it. In a farming land. Jerry, yeah. I'm getting frustrated. Can't grow plants like you, in a farmland. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Farmers want to grow yeah. some, some plants, yeah. and they can't. Yeah. It's a plant that people are willing to pay like thousands of dollars mm -hmm. for a pound for. Yeah. But, oh, sorry, farmer, you have to grow the stuff we're going to give you pennies on the ton yeah. for. Yeah, that's yeah. just for our buddies. Yeah. Yeah. you back in the other places. <laughs> oh, man, I am, I am burning out. I am getting frustrated. I'm getting angry. Uh, you know, I'm getting headaches. I'm just not okay about all this. It's just so wrong. It gets wrong, more wrong every day instead of more right every day. Oh, that's not that true. Look what else I got. I got... Uh, L.A., Los Angeles, are dismissing 58,000 uh, cannabis convictions. Nice. So that's good. Uh, Washington is easing the license uh, re well, uh, restrictions yeah. for felons. So, you know, there's some movement in the United what States. What are they going to do that? They said they were going to do that here, and I think we've only had like 500 to date. Yeah, and it's a really difficult yeah, process, and, and it's expensive. 500 of his friends. Yeah, <laughs> 500 people. They've been they've been yeah. convicting 50,000 people a year yeah. here in Canada for a long time. Yeah. And it's just horrible how many people have criminal yeah. records. Yeah, less than 500. That was a few months ago. That. So, on the psychedelic front, that's another one, uh, where the government has decided that you don't get to think a certain way. You can't have your, your mind altered. You have, and that's all it does. It doesn't kill you. It doesn't hurt you. No, nobody's in hospital because they've been taking LSD or eating magic mushrooms. In hospital and dead from eating wrong mushrooms, but that's another story. But the psychedelics have never, never caused us problems in society with respect to medical issues for people or hospitalizations or deaths no, or anything. Well, like yeah, well, I'm sure there's. Oh, some people. Uh, yeah. But it's not ever yeah, been. It's, it's not, not no. ever been a big and problem. I think more of that was back when nobody had knowledge. Now people be, are educated and, be almost, and, they can, and they can research, right, before they do a drug. It would uh, be almost zero if you compared it to the harm caused by alcohol. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the, yeah, the, oh, yeah, for sure, yeah. It's on, it's on the bottom scale. So there's no the harm difference. that's a justification mm -hmm. for keeping people from using psychedelics and using the criminal law against yeah. people who would just like to pick a mushroom. Yeah. But they've done it anyway, and it's been going on for a long time. And as, as I've gone on, down this journey with you, uh, I've really had to wrap my brain around, you know, what it's all about. And it's just the most stupid thing in the world. There's people that are struggling, that have PTSD and other issues to do with traumas, to have pain issues yeah. and depression issues, and, and the psychedelics can help these people. And they're not allowed to use it. Why? Well, because we're hoping it's going to change you know, soon. We're you hoping know? it's going to change. You're working yeah. hard on that. Yeah. Uh, you've got two different companies that uh, work on that in, yeah. in two different ways. Tell me about those. Yeah, Microdelics is the uh, we sell psychedelic analogs uh, and pro drugs. That's and, these and things just, up here for microdosing yeah. uh, DMT, LSD, and, and psilocybin. Yeah, just, just legal products that aren't in the CDSA. Right. Uh, so we can sell it for research purposes, and people do their own research. Uh, and, and you can microdose it. You could also, if you buy a microdosing kit, you could do you know, all of it at once. It's not recommended, but I mean, people can right. do that. Yeah. And so you, they can have that experience as well. Yeah. So good on you for that. And then, and then the other one, uh, this is about gathering information, isn't it? And eventually a court challenge and peer-reviewed studies. Yeah, it's a whole combination of different things. And is that uh, for microdelics? Uh, no, it's for mind tech. Oh, that's mind tech. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, a whole bunch of different things. Uh, uh, you know, we're trying to put together a biopharmaceutical company. Right. Um, and then... Uh, as so as a biopharmaceutical company, you would have the psychedelics, uh, cannabis, uh, would you have any other? Uh, I guess we technically could do cannabis, because uh, I, uh, I don't know the particular guy we want to partner with does have cannabis uh, licenses. And cannabis in, can be psychoactive, like, yeah. like uh, hallucinogenic, yeah, yeah, sure. uh, in the high ends of uh, edibles and, yeah. and things. It can alter your mind. It does alter your right, mind. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's in that category. And, and really, there again, you know, that's what the whole fear is, uh, except with cannabis, well, it's, it's all medical. The big fear is that it's going to be used by people to deal with medical issues, psychological and medical issues, that are going to take away from the money they would otherwise spend. Yeah, they don't on, want it affordable. That's yeah, they don't sure. want it affordable. They don't no, want it because used. Because then they'll, they'll switch. Right? So. Exactly. Exactly. So, we're dealing with corruption, 
we're trying we're up against extremely big odds the, the the groups that are trying to prevent access to these things are very well leveraged yeah very well funded very connected yeah uh, you know they already have most of the influential politicians right you know so it's a tough battle but the, it's it's a little easier because they got nothing like I don't know how they argue anything. Yeah. You know what are they going to say? Is look, I got yeah. PTSD. It's been a real debilitating thing in my. I'm not talking yeah. about myself personally. A person says I got PTSD. It's been a really debilitating uh, thing in my life. I've been using these these uh, mushrooms for quite a while now, and it's really helping me. Yeah. And what are what are these? What what, what, what are, kind of they, argument do they have yeah. back at well, that? Well, they, 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 uh, they are certain to allow some, but it's a trickle. Yeah. It is. Right? So, but so how can they not allow it? But you should I mean, have just, to go to court to be able to help people. You know what I mean? That, that's, you shouldn't that's a be problem. fighting your government who's using your money. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's over 2,500 qualified MAPS therapists now. Right, eh? All right, wow. ready to go. So, yeah. yeah. And that was not a cheap course for them to take either. It was like 30 grand U.S. course. So. Yeah. Yeah, very in depth. Yeah, so I I, I think it's going to happen because, like I said, I don't think the evil empire has any arguments yeah. uh, in their favor at all. That's uh, it. They just they've been scaring people for a long time with it. They, they scared people with LSD decades ago, and they right. haven't have, had to say much ever since. People just in mainstream society yeah. think that LSD is this horribly dangerous drug. Yeah, as presidents have taken it, all, all kinds of yeah, it's uh, yeah. And it's been used therapeutically with yeah. great success. Yeah. And especially these days, and and that's kind of what you're doing as well, right? Like you're you're gathering statistics on people that are. We using will it. be. We will be. Um, I went and tried out. Uh, Doctor Goyle was uh, in from uh, Toronto yesterday, mm -hmm. so I went to his hotel, and then we tried this uh, brain brain monitoring system. I see that we can use. So how does that um, work? Um, so they put all. It's uh, I can show you, It's like a rubber brain. Right, yeah. it all you know, and yeah. the nodes attached to you, and they set it up in the computer. So it's a, it's a, it's a big yeah head it, piece. It can be used for different functions. It's a headpiece with a bunch of nodes. Yeah, it's and does it have EG wires basically. coming off of it? Uh, no, one, it, wire. It, it, one, one wire. One wire. Yeah, yeah, they're pretty advanced now. Yeah, and most yeah. things are wireless, or they can all con connect to the one wire. Right. Yeah. So I, mean, there's big kid, I tried the, the, you know, the basic tests that they do for uh, to see how your brain works to get the baseline. It tells you all kinds of different things with right. your ADD, like this this program. Really? So yeah, so so we so can, it can tell you just by sitting it on your head right. and having so, to think a few things. So we compare the two. Uh, we know when they're not on psychedelics, when right. they're on psychedelics. Right. But it also shows the brain lighting up in certain areas. And, wow. You know, it's yeah. exciting. Yeah, it's That's cool. Exciting. Yeah, it's cool. And there again, I'm waiting to see what yeah. kind of arguments are going to be presented by the the side that wants to keep these things restricted from people. You know, people are getting help with this stuff. Uh, the the technology is obviously there to be able to figure out oh, yeah. what's helping people. Yeah, it's cool. So uh, yeah, I think we're on the verge yeah. of a huge revolution with respect yeah. to our access to to these plant medicines. And uh, you've heard me before say that uh, my whole pursuit of uh, legalization is really the pursuit of freedom. That's what that's what is my core yeah, goal. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And the yeah. idea that you're not free enough to yeah. be able to go and pick a mushroom yeah. and ingest it. Because you're depressed and you think it yeah. can help you. Confining somebody's you know, freedom is one thing. Confining their mind is a totally different thing. It is. Yeah. And, and I it mean, is the result. Same, but different. And it results in a yeah. lot of problems for people. And so we could, we could make the world a much better place if we could end this ridiculous war on people who want to use other drugs than the government allows. And, and that's all it is. It's a war against people who want to use plant medicines and other drugs that the, the government doesn't approve. The government should have no business approving anything with respect to drugs. They can analyze, they can determine the, the properties, and they can educate about all those things. But uh, denying access should not be part of that because you never know who's going to be helped by what. People should be able to try what they want without fear they of criminal. They should be bound to go out of their way to find medical benefits from, from, they should from be. any, any plant it? or any medicine. Yeah. 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 They should be. I mean, they're, yeah. they're absolutely they in the opposite it. of what they're supposed to be yeah. doing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, same with the cannabis thing. They're, they're, all the efforts of the government by Mr. Seguin and Health Canada are all about restricting the access to cannabis. I used to do that with Gretchen all the time. Yeah, with the Gretchen. Yeah. Yeah. I can't help yeah. it. Yeah. 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 I yeah. know. Yeah. 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 He was going to smoke a joint when he retired, he said. Yeah. yeah. And I'm sure he smoked a joint before yeah, he retired, yeah, too, did. you know. 
yeah. these prime ministers. Yeah. Remember Pierre Elliott uh, talking yeah. about how when he was asked about it, he was like, I've smoked many things. Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. because that's what you do. Because it opens your mind. When, when you're, you're, when you're a prime minister. When you're a prime minister, you go and visit all these other places around the world. Yeah. You, you sample the different things that they're involved yeah. with. You, you, you want to be a renaissance well, man. Well, certainly you want to try the different drugs they have. You, of course you do. <laughs> well, that's part of, you know, you're yeah. the prime minister. Somebody's got to try these yeah. things, you know, and... Uh, and so, yeah, that, that I think that's fine. Yeah. I don't think anybody involved in, in coming up with regulations on cannabis should be people that have not used cannabis regularly. Like, what do they know about anything? How can they possibly be trusted yeah. with the cannabis file with all the lies that we've been told for decades yeah. about cannabis? Yeah, and they don't smoke any or they never try it. And talk about truth and reconciliation. When are we going to have truth and reconciliation for the cannabis community? Because we've been lied what to. What happened to that court case with the privacy thing? It's still ongoing. I saw. I got a notification about that. Yeah, I don't get notifications anymore. Yeah, I did get a notification about that. And it's yeah. still ongoing. Yeah. But yeah, the government needs to come clean. Like you know, admit that the previous governments were all lying about weed to That's protect corporate like interests. Seven years now. Yeah? yeah, it's a long time. Yeah. Why so long? I wonder. Yeah? Because they don't want to pay. All lawyers get all the money in the end. They, the lawyers. And the drive, longer it goes on, the more they get. The, bill, the bills there, right? So, or, I don't know, they could be doing that as a percentage base, too. But I think if they've been fighting that long... I don't yeah. know. I guess I don't want to accuse lawyers. Yeah. Yeah, my lawyers making... have been pretty good, so... Yeah. But yeah. a lot of lawyers. John you know, Conroy has been absolutely Yeah, fabulous. no, he's awesome. He's but I've been dealt with a lot of lawyers. I know he made a lot, lot of money of over the years, but I know that he also didn't yeah. bill for a lot of hours for many different things. He's yeah. done a lot of stuff. And now, I mean, I, I sent a friend to him who one of our uh, suppliers for uh, the cannabis substitution program making concentrates that got raided out in mission. And uh, I had him get a hold of John. And John, no hesitation, yeah. pro bono, yeah. you know, going to do yeah. whatever it takes to help you. So not all lawyers are bad. Uh, and I, yeah, and I, no. I, I, yeah. I certainly like the presentations and the way the case has been handled by the lawyers that are involved in your constitutional challenge. First notch. First, yeah, no, first they, class, they both did a really notch. good job. Yeah, yeah, very impressed. I was a little nervous because uh, I didn't know the other guy, but no, he, he's really good. Mark Burton. Mark Burton, yeah. very good, yeah. yeah. Um, he is a presence. Like, yeah. Uh, he is yeah. somebody that you would pay attention to if yeah. he's talking, right? Like, yeah, he for has sure. that presence about him. Yeah. And so, yeah, I'm very, very impressed with yeah. the lawyers that you've got working for you. I'm very Glad impressed you got a green screen with John that. Conroy and Jack Lloyd, who was helping us with the CSP before that. Uh, fantastic human beings uh, doing great work for us, and without them, we'd be hooped. For sure, because we have to go through the courts on this stuff. Yeah, you know, we're not going to get satisfied. Yeah, somebody's got to do it. Somebody's, somebody's got to do it. So, <laughs> and we may be there too uh, with the CSP. I'm sure uh, Health Canada is waiting for your decision. I'm sure that's going to yeah. uh, bear quite largely on uh, on what they're going to do with us. Uh, but you know, we're to the point. Is still there? Yeah, there's a number Excuse of them that are man. still illegal. Yeah, uh, they're getting fined apparently fairly regularly, but yeah. they're paying those fines. Well, and, yeah, uh, two fifty a day, it's worth over the store. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it is. They're charging pretty high prices there, and yeah. you know, and they have to, I guess, because they're getting fined every day, yeah. and they're probably going to end up having to pay lawyers yeah. down the road, and yeah. maybe they get their stuff seized. I don't yeah. know, but uh, you know, I've never been in there. I don't know. I'd throw it by the One day, I'm gonna. Oh, you don't want to do that. I'm gonna yeah. say we should put together a package of how much it's cost you. Yeah, I don't um, want to do that to you, Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> You're depressed enough as it is. Yeah. Let me get the heart back in shape. I just got my blood flow monitored yesterday. It was not good. It's like the worst they ever monitored, he said. <laughs> I haven't had a cigarette in 24 hours. Wow, does that mean you quit? Yeah, I'm done, man. I'm turning 50 Sunday. Nice. Yeah. Nice. You yeah. made it to bonus time. Chest is burning all the time. I can't breathe. And well, good for you for burning. quitting, man. Yeah, yeah. Well, I didn't even know you smoked cigarettes. Yeah. I don't pay attention to that with my friends. Yeah. I kind of ignore that. Yeah. I kind of wish it wasn't happening, but I didn't yeah. know. I yeah, I'm feeling all it. All my sure. staff as well. Too, all my yeah, staff. almost. Two. I have three staff. Yeah. One didn't smoke to begin with. The other two were heavy smokers, yeah. and they both quit. That does look real good. Yeah. Yeah, it's looking real healthy. Yeah. You can see that color right in his face. Yeah. I always say every time I go by with a cigarette. Yeah. <laughs> Sucking yeah. on poison, it's what a dirty scam that is. That. How so crazy. I still got the nicotine, I got the patch on it, I do what I gotta do. But at least How my crazy, lungs don't feel you know, better. Uh, my pursuit of, uh, of sanity with respect to cannabis regulations is helped a lot mm. by the fact that they sell commercial cigarettes, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Holy crap. Mm. 
you know, anything that uh, is wrong about yeah. reefer madness is right about uh, commercial tobacco. Uh, that stuff is dangerous. Oh my God! Oh, it's we have more brutal, hospitalizations man. that result from cigarette smoking in Canada than for any other reason. Uh, so yeah, the the fact that they allow the sale of commercial tobacco right next to elementary schools, yeah. every grocery store, gas station, yeah. you know, so that's like the worst addiction. Uh, oh, you know, ever and yet had, for man. for cannabis, which yeah. would offset the use of cigarettes for people, like I know lots yeah. of people who gave up my uncles. Gave up uh, smoking cigarettes for weed. Uh, you know, I mean, that would help the situation in, in deaths. Yet to get cannabis in a legal country like Canada, which is legal for a few years here, but for all the time before that, it was completely illegal. But now, when cannabis is legal and cigarettes are legal, you can get cigarettes in grocery stores and gas stations yeah, all over the everywhere. place. Everywhere. You get like, what do you get? 20 cigarettes for 20 bucks, like a buck a piece, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Uh, but to yes, get cannabis, yeah. you're not supposed to buy it off anybody but the government. So forget that anything else exists. There's yeah. just the government uh, places for it. Good caffeine too. And you have to be like, uh, you have to show ID. The cost is incredible. The restrictions on, yeah. on the whole thing are ridiculous. I mean, they, they require that all the microbes be killed. Well, can you imagine how, how much tobacco would be in a cigarette if they took out all the harmful components yeah. from, from that? It would just be paper, and even that's harmful to smoke, so you wouldn't get anything. It's ludicrous. Ludicrous, I tell you. I'm getting to the point where I'm going to start running through the streets yelling, I can't take it anymore. Yeah. I'm going crazy. I feel you. Yeah. You're only one battle oh, at a time. And you and I both are involved in these frustrating battles. Yeah, you know? it is frustrating. Um, I can't stop, and Jerry, I'm sorry, but you yeah. can't stop either. Yeah. We need you, brother. Yeah. I mean, we'll do everything we can to try to make it as easy yeah. for you, but you know, Drags we on. need you. They need me to. Uh, yeah. You know, I can't stop. We need to have low barrier access to cannabis, and that's the fight that you and I are on. You're also on the fight for psychedelics, and I'm going to join you there as soon as we get yeah. <laughs> this here. But it's really, really, really frustrating as hell. And I don't know how much longer we can keep this up, but it, but I know that I can keep it up until I win. And I know that you will too, even though you have days when you don't want to, you keep doing it. Yeah. You, you've come to the point of quitting so many times over the yeah. last uh, oh, five years. Hundreds. <laughs> hundreds of times. Hundreds. And yet you never have. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for that. And I know I'm asking a lot by yeah. asking you to continue on. But, uh, you know, this is our lot in life. And maybe it'll be over. Maybe you and I will be out fishing one of yeah. these years, not too far down the future, yeah. and we won't have to worry about this anyway. Yeah. Way. I sure hope so, Jerry. I really do. Well, thank you for Sounds coming nice. and updating us every week here. I appreciate that a lot. Uh, November 5th, so we won't have another... Yeah, that's my telephone, I think. Yeah. And then uh, the 16th, 17th, probably by Zoom, I'm assuming. Okay. And, uh, yeah. and then we still won't know until the decision is made. Yeah. And we'll just keep talking about it until that happens, and then we'll talk about whatever the decision is, and then we'll talk about whatever we need to do from there. Wouldn't it be nice if you got a good decision? Yeah, and then, it would be and nice. then the following week they call us up and say, "Okay, we're yeah. going to allow low barrier access." Yeah, it's a no nice. brainer. Come on, people. Poor people, yeah. sick people. They need to have a herb that's easy yeah. to grow. What's the problem? Like, what is the problem? The problem is rich people that don't want to let it be sold cheap. That's the only problem. How bad is that? we got to stop yeah. that. We're we pretty, pretty bra brainwashed people. Very brainwashed yeah. people. Yeah, yeah, we have been for sure. Yeah. And, you know, human beings are like that. Yeah. And these sophisticated... It's unique, hard to break those people. laws. You make those agreements you make with yourself. Yeah, yeah. that's true too. It's you, right? It's your that's identity. You. Yeah. yeah, it's hard for humans yeah. to break their own habits. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really hard because that's all part of... Uh, brainwashing as well, or right. hypnosis, or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. When we come to, to, to form our habits, they become pretty solidly ingrained. Like you say, oh, yeah, we make deals sure. with ourselves yeah. and, and agreements. And yeah. So, uh, but we're going to get there. This is the way to get there. I don't know of any other way to get there. Is you do what you're doing, and I'm doing what I'm doing, and I think that has to be done. We have to do this. Without it, the the, the, the movement stops. Like everybody just accepts the regulations the way they are. Mm. It gets really seriously entrenched because a bunch of very rich people are getting richer out of this, and that's why we can't turn around drug prohibition as it is, is because there's a bunch of rich people getting rich off of prohibition. And so to turn that around is really, really hard. These people that are making money don't want to mm -hmm. give that up, and they're willing to spend quite a bit to keep it coming in. Mm -hmm. So we're up against pretty serious odds. We have a chance because we're telling the truth. We've got right on our side, 
But uh, that has not won the day so far in this world uh, in a lot of different things. So we'll just keep fighting at it until we do. And thank you so much for being there and doing that. And uh, in the end, one of these days, we'll smoke a big fatty and yeah. celebrate and think it was worth it. I believe that, Jerry. I believe you're going to yeah. think it was worth it in the end. That's my... Yeah. Well, I just believe. I can't promise you that. Yeah. But I believe that. <laughs> thank you so much, my brother. And... Uh, We'll see you here next week, and right. we'll uh, do it all over again until we get that satisfaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe they'll drop the case. You know that could happen. Yeah. So you don't. You're not just waiting until well, yeah. early December to get a decision. It yeah. could happen. Yeah. No. Not. <laughs> it could happen uh, before I don't that. Think so. <coughs> yeah. Well, no, you never just, know. They're just doing the end part, and then it's judge going over everything. So. They have uh, given us a, a very I large platform to be able to protest against yeah. them for a long time. That, that, that's what they do by dragging these things out. Yeah. I would have stopped complaining about them a long time ago if they yeah. had given us our license to be in the store here. So yeah. if they want that to stop, if you want us to yeah. you know, back off on t telling you how corrupt the government is, or telling everybody how corrupt the government is, then uh, you know, give us the licenses. Yeah, that's what you do. Easy, easy. Thanks, yeah. Jerry. Yeah. We'll see you next week. So that brings us to the, uh, the update on our quest for a community-based, low-barrier access cannabis store. We've been trying to achieve that by addressing the opioid overdose death epidemic. Because surely cannabis can be approved for low-barrier access for people that would use it instead of the opioids. Surely that would be the case, wouldn't it? We thought so. Uh, we knew that. I knew that. Uh, working at the Herb School back in the day, uh, starting out in 2004, uh, I learned there, I mean, we were right uh, a block away from Maine and Hastings, not even a block away, half a block away from Maine and Hastings, uh, the number one drug dealing area in North America, uh, the, the home to uh, so many homeless, uh, poor, addicted people. And so right there in the heart of, of the poverty and the drug addiction and the homelessness, uh, knowing what, what I knew about the efficacy of cannabis high dose edibles to get people off of those opioids, cannabis smoked medicine or smoked isn't enough to get people off of opioids and meth. Um, it just isn't. Uh, you can't smoke too much. Uh, you smoke to a point where maybe you will pass out. Uh, that's it. With cannabis high-dose edibles, you can really eat too much. Uh, you can have a very, very uncomfortable two or three days even if you eat way too much cannabis high-dose edibles. So because you can eat too much, you can eat enough. A person that is using opioids and street drugs to deal with serious trauma, pain, they can, they can find the same relief, that same level of relief from high-dose edibles. So having learned that back uh, in 2004, in 2016, when the uh, overdose epidemic hit here in Vancouver and, and in North America, uh, knowing what I knew about uh, cannabis high-dose edibles being effective for getting people through withdrawal and then replacing the use of those hard drugs, uh, I first went to the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users Organization, the big advocacy group here in Vancouver, uh, presented my ideas to them about providing cannabis high-dose edibles for free uh, to make it as easy as possible for people to get access to them. I got unanimous uh, support from Vandu. I took that to City Council and solicited them for support and, and, and help and acknowledgement without success. I also uh, presented to the Vancouver Police Board. Uh, I got some acknowledgement from them in any case. Uh, a deputy chief came and talked to me and thanked me and shook my hand and gave me his personal contact information. And uh, we started the program. For three and a half years, uh, we ran our program. After two and a half years of it, uh, City Council passed a motion saying that they would unanimously support low barrier access to cannabis uh, for the opioid crisis based on what we were doing. And based on uh, reports of what we were doing from Dr. MJ Malloy, who'd been studying us, he's a professor at UBC. And so with that, we looked for a storefront to provide low barrier access to cannabis. Being honest, of course, with, in fact, all the way through, uh, I have been upfront and honest. I've never tried to hide. I've never tried to be a sneaky drug dealer or anything like that. Uh, I've tried to do the right thing and do it openly and do it with full knowledge of all the uh, public servants that would be involved. And we've certainly done that with this program. And so 
I was also open and honest with all the potential landlords and the question always came up about are you part of the Cannabis Act? Are you licensed by the federal government or by the provincial government to be able to sell cannabis? And our response would be, well, not yet, but we intend on being that. Uh, we have the support of the uh, municipal government. But uh, it took us a year to find anybody that would rent to us. But we did find a landlord who liked what we were doing, who believed in us and rented to us. And so we opened up a storefront uh, in June of last year. And for five months, uh, we operated out of a storefront. But in that length of time, uh, to begin with, we didn't get support from city council, as they said they would. Uh, instead, we got uh, licensing department people here who were not even aware of the motion that the councillors passed that insisted that we have a provincial license to sell cannabis. We tried to go that route and found out that what we're doing is not uh, covered under the provincial non-medical cannabis sales, that it would have to be through uh, special licensing and exemption division of Health Canada. And so we put in a very large comprehensive uh, uh, application for licenses for us, our staff and for our suppliers. And at the same time, we submitted a, a, an emergency application for a temporary exemption to be able to continue what we were doing. Because at that time, we were now being forced with eviction because the landlord had been threatened by city licensing. And although he didn't want to evict us, uh, on the advice of his lawyer, he felt he had no choice. He dragged it out as long as he could. But we did end up in front of a judge and we did end up evicted. And so, and seven days to get out of our store as well not enough time to find another location and so we uh, we bought an RV and we've been selling cannabis and distributing cannabis through the program uh, for the last uh, 10 plus no 11 plus months we're no at the end of this month it'll be 11 months we were out at the end of November or end of October a year ago and uh, it's just about the end of September now so we're 11 months in an RV parked on the curb out right by the store that we had um, where you're not allowed to park more than two hours at a time, for one thing. We do pay for parking all day, every day, because we don't want to have that obstacle in front of us. We have gotten one ticket for being parked more than two hours, which we haven't paid, and that's under dispute. Uh, we did have to stand down uh, the parking people early on about what we were doing here, because the VPD had told them to move us, and I refused to move, and uh, uh, promised to pay every ticket they would issue to us if they issued us tickets. And so, I'm, and the VPD did that because uh, two weeks after moving into the RV, I had big signs all over the place uh, talking about what we were doing, making sure everybody that walked by and drove by knew what we were doing here and in, in helping people get access to cannabis. When they came two weeks after moving into the RV and raided us and stole all of the cannabis that we had and made us take all of our signs and our tent down, uh, they at that time didn't realize who we were and what we were doing. The deputy chief that I've had a relationship with is not part of that command area. Uh, I got him involved. Um, he had a, 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 the head of the VPD downtown east side cops call me and ask me about what was going on. Uh, that wasn't a very friendly call because in the end, after describing everything that uh, that has gone on and being very careful to uh, let her know that uh, you know we had doctors that had written letters for us that were stating clearly, including uh, Professor Zachary uh, um, Walsh, the foremost expert on such things, saying that if we stop doing what we're doing, people will die. And after explaining all that to uh, Candace Murphy for about 20 minutes, uh, she said, well, gee, Neil, we're really sorry to hear all of that, and we really hope you can get your license soon, but in the meantime, you're going to have to stop doing what you're doing because it's illegal. And I said, what did you just say to me? Did you not hear what I told you? Like, Seriously, people will be put at risk of death if we stop our program. I'm not stopping the program. She says, we're telling you to stop, so you have to stop. I said, I don't care if you're telling us to stop. I'm not stopping. She says, we're going to arrest you then. And I said, you do whatever you have to do. Uh, you know, I'll tell you right now. You arrest me. There's 10 other people that will take my place. You seize our vehicle. We'll have one back there within an hour. You might not care about these people that we're helping, but there's hundreds of them, and we care about them, and we're not going to stop. So that's where it ended. Um, and we've seen nothing of them in 10 months. Uh, there's been no VPD come and talk to us or stop by in the 10 months that we've been obviously still here doing what we're doing. They, they know about us for sure. But, um, you know, they're waiting for Health Canada just like we're waiting for Health Canada. In the meantime, uh, when we moved into the store, we changed from having a project where people lined up for hours to get just a care pack with a few edibles, half a dozen edibles and a joint, to a program 
where we registered over 250 people uh, and provide them with the 420 milligrams of high dose edibles for free every four days of their choosing uh, along with the you know we kept stats on uh, on uh, how it was helping them and all that kind of stuff we've ceased doing that since we've been in the rv because it's too complicated uh, you know many times it's uh, bad weather out there we've gone through uh, harsh winters in our opinion uh, harsh summers in anybody's opinion and so we try to be as quick as we can in getting people on the, on their way at the rv we do keep track of everything that people choose for themselves so we get a, a real handle on whether people want the cbd or the thc or and in what levels and in what form uh, whether it be topicals or caps or suppositories or whatever it is we have been tracking for all of this time everything that people choose for themselves so we can know each individual's uh, uh, wants uh, but also to be able to present to government that we consider ourselves to be a research collecting uh, group and we're hoping that government will use the the information that we're gathering to be able to further put together a project that will help people even more than they are being helped but we are profoundly helping uh, a number of people uh, close to 300 now that are part of the the program and there's uh, at least 100 other people that, that we haven't been able to include in the program that do come to us on a regular basis and they never get turned away. We have 100 milligram cupcakes, so we have 30 milligram cookies and a joint for everybody that uh, isn't part of the program and is, and is in need and can't afford to, uh, to purchase the products that we have even though our prices are kept as low as we can keep them. Uh, so that's where we're at. And we're out in the RV still doing it. And uh, as always on the show, we're going to go out there and just see uh, what's happening with those people. So welcome to downtown Vancouver. And much to our surprise, it's a quite nice day out here today. Uh, the forecast this morning was for heavy rain starting around 11 a.m., a couple inches of rain by the end of the day, but uh, that didn't happen. It cleared up and it's actually quite nice out here, so that's awesome. So here's our RV. There's Jennifer Nelson. She's our, our window manager. Hello. Hi, Jen. What's she doing in there? Oh, you're doing drug <laughs> testing. It's very important that we test all the all the things we have here so that we know ourselves how they work and if they work and if there's any problems. Well, we got to stay medicated to take care of everybody else. That's right. <laughs> you got to make sure everybody... There's that too. As much as we try to have as much fun as we can every day, and we do have a fair amount of fun here, uh, this is a stressful neighborhood to be in. Uh, we see people that are struggling so hard that it's, it's hard for us to... You know, to, to deal with that. We're all empathetic people and, and, you know, we don't like to see people hurting and suffering. So it's difficult for us to, to be here day after day dealing with all this. So it's good that we have cannabinoids and, 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 a, and a strict regime of making sure they all get tested to, uh, to keep everybody in a good family. It's a very strict, I, I'm a strict taskmaster, cracking the whip on these people. Test those drugs, test those drugs, you know. We need to know. So anyway, let's go see what happens if we knock on the back door. This is the CSP access point. This is where the, the, uh, the people come to, uh, to get their 420 milligrams. Now you know the secret knock. And there secret, you are. Hello, the Andrew. Secret. How's it going? Very well. How are you today? Not bad. That's good. What's new today? What's new? I've done, I've had about 27 people today. 27 people so far today. That's so good. And they all get 420 milligrams. Not everybody takes 420. Oh, see. Sometimes you put the other But they can if they want. But with the edibles, we give them close to 420. Sometimes you can't make 420 with the edibles you got. Sometimes you go a little over, sometimes you go a little they under. If you want cookies, I got 100 milligram cookies. You give them four, that's 400 milligrams. Show us, the, show us your tray. I haven't got anything in my tray. Nothing in the tray? I got it right here. Okay. I got some 80 milligram, I got some 100 milligram cookies from Robert. Okay. Yep. Does that and, look good or what, eh? And I've got double chocolate. Double chocolate, chocolate chips. Too. We've got to have two different kinds, right? For those people that can't get enough chocolate. No, he's pretty good. He brings me about 200. I got some of these. This is 250 milligrams. That's from Carly Teeson. THC. Yeah. So it's pretty powerful. The whole thing comes to 250. Lots of people like those. Lots of people like them. I've got very little left. And I've got some 
cookies here. I got some cookies from uh, Joe Pepper. Joe Pepper. Joe, Joe Pepper has been so awesome. Cookies. Joe Pepper has been helping our program since the very beginning. She showed up real early when I was starting to hand it out at Van Du yes. and started baking brownies for us and helping out with all kinds of different things down there. And she still comes every few days and brings us cookies and sits with us for a while and we're really, really happy to have her involved. Now Robert again, I got 150 milligram caramels. They're very popular. I got, I got uh, THC cubes. Gummy cubes. It's from Green Wilderness. Yep. Green yep. Wilderness again, and one of our big supporters. For, they approached me about six months into the, the program at Van Du, so over four and a half years, or, or over four years ago now, and uh, have just been fabulous uh, supporters. You just picked up some marijuana leaf gummies. Yeah. There's uh, five in there at 20 milligrams each. Also from Green Wilderness. Yes. I got some uh, gummy bears right here. This is 20 milligram. There's 20 inside at five milligrams each, so that's 100. And that's important because some people don't need very much, and no, so it's good that they can have smaller amounts, like five milligrams. Five milligrams is very good. For yeah, like one of these caramels is 150, so it's you know it's hard to, it'd be hard to find five milligrams in that, right? But this way we make it easy for those people. This to kind, we got this kind, CBD. Yeah, Gorilla we had, Ganja. Because we had so many of the other uh, THC, so I brought these. Maybe the best supporter of ours yes. throughout the years. Uh, we also I don't know have about. Uh, Black Cherry one to one, and then we have Sativa one to one. And we have uh, the raspberry at uh, just THC, and we have CBD. And Gorilla Ganja you can find in lots of different dispensaries. Uh, this Green Wilderness in some dispensaries. Yeah. They're looking for more dispensaries that are, will, will carry their products. Yes, they will. Here, take have, these back for me. I also have pills uh, that we've been getting in. I got take those back. I got some, because uh, people, we have a lot of people who like pills. Yeah, I because some, some people are diabetic, or they, they just don't want all the sugar and, and other stuff. These are full of Keef. They're 50 milligrams each, the pills. People like them, they're very good. Yeah. These ones are full of uh, uh, liquid. These ones are 50 milligrams each. I have people that just take pills, and they love them. It helps. So would these be from weeds, do you think? Yes. And these are from our friend Brian. Brian, you know who you are. Thank yeah. you very much. Oh my God. Honey here, right here, right, right. Medicated honey is Medicated awesome. Medicated honey, people love it. And some snake oil, people love it. Really good tough really stuff. Really good. Yeah. And we also have We have some one to one. Right, from Colleen. Yes, we have one. And we have snacks from Colleen too, don't we? Yes, we do. We yes, have, do you have snacks out here? We have snacks out here? Uh, not in the CSP, we ran out of snacks. Oh, I see. We ran out of cheeses already, yes, we did. So we have more in the shop. No but anyway, thanks to shop, Colleen yeah. for all of her help over the years as well. She's been fabulous, right? Since early, early on as well. Uh, many of these donators of ours have been helping us for yeah, a very long time. I've known them for a long time. They're, always, they're great. It's like a family here. That's Everybody how it works. It's all about donations. Um, yeah. You know, we had a head baker here, Mary, was so fabulous for us, and she had to go back to London, Ontario, and she had to take the project with her back there, so she started the CSB back in London, Ontario, and she did uh, over 200 bags. She does it every Tuesday. Yeah. Over 200 people got uh, care packs from her today. Uh, she's doing just a fantastic job there. Cares. Uh, cares in Halifax, well. Chris Backer with uh, with his uh, cannabis substitution program, almost in its uh, almost two years now that nice. they've been doing it there. Uh, nice. He did about 220 very, very packs nice. uh, yesterday. They do every Monday oh, there beautiful. in Halifax. Beautiful. So uh, and and there's also others as well. Uh, Jason Lafashi in Sudbury is doing a uh, cannabis right? substitution program there. Uh, Ward Taylor is handing out cannabis in his neighborhood. We're helping all the and I think there's a lot right, of people that are helping that are doing help that we don't even know neighborhoods about. Neighborhoods need help, right? And it, it needs it's, to happen all across. Canada. Yeah, it sure does. Why not? We need to, everybody needs help. Yeah, we just got to ask for it, right? And Low barrier access should be a thing in every neighborhood. Every in Canada. neighborhood. Yeah, it should be. There's right? poor people and sick people in Canada that, that need. And everybody deserves low barrier access to sure cannabis. Nobody of course wants they to do. The high price and to get medical do. cannabis, it, everybody needs to be able to have access to that. Who wants to pay $12 for a gram somewhere, right? You walk to a dispensary right now, you're paying $12 for wedding cake that we have right here. You can pay $6.
and our wedding cake will be better than yours Lots. because our wedding wedding cake is fresh. You can see it put right into a cup and weighed right there. It's not in a bag. You don't walk over to the counter, open the drawer, and grab a bag out. It's fresh. That's yeah. what people like, fresh. You and can we, smell and it. And we care for the people. You guys don't care for the people. Yeah. You guys are in a store right now, and you're work, and you're doing what the government says. They're not we're, even allowed to tell them, talk about the benefits no, of cannabis in the government stores. No, you're not. So we talk to the people, get to know them, see how they're doing, and help them with the problems. Right? Exactly. We'll give them a joint or a cookie if we if they don't have anything right. But we're here to help. Yeah. Right. That's what we're here for, and we're going to be here until it happens. Until we get what we need. Thanks, Andrew. I appreciate no your dedication. Thanks. Let's go in and say hi to the other folks. Hey, there's George, the other member of the crew. How you doing, George? Not doing too bad. That's good. Roll, roll, roll your joints. Yeah. That's what. That's what. That's what. Uh, George does most of his time here as he rolls joints for us. People really like to have their joints. So what else is new with you guys? Jen's, Jen's at the window busy. Jen had things she wanted to say last week and I didn't let her say it because I didn't realize she had things she wanted to say and now I'm ready for her. You claim to not like to talk. You like to talk. Well, I, have, I have to talk. I don't really enjoy that I have to talk, but I have to talk. So. Uh -huh. Somebody's got to talk. <laughs> I uh, tell the truth, Jen. $70. If you think I enjoy uh, flapping my gums for two hours, uh, yeah, you're two wrong. Days, right? <laughs> 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 oh, it's been a good day. <laughs> it has been a good day. It's not, it hasn't been raining. It's been a nice day. We enjoy being out here. Yeah, it was supposed to be rainy. It was rainy yesterday. And yeah, we've had it was raining pretty hard here today. But we, we enjoy being out here. Why not? Well, that's good. We enjoy what we're doing. We love marijuana, so we enjoy what we're doing out here. It's a tough job, eh? Come on. It's, Who would want this job? We see, all kinds of, <laughs> we see all kinds of people every day, and different things happen every day. So we shouldn't be surprised, what's, you know, and don't wait for things to happen, but they just do. Like these three have been here since the beginning of, we of the store. We aren't on drugs. Um, we meet people that are, you know, that just want a little bit of help to talk to. They're not even on drugs. We have people that are on drugs and we deal with it. Oh, we like what we're doing, right? Yes, so much so much so that I can't even get rid of you guys. No, you can't. And uh, they've been here since the beginning. Uh, yeah. since I, know the beginning. You, I didn't know you were trying to get rid of us. <laughs> no, I'm not. But, uh, you know, that'd be hard to we, do because we uh, nobody's going to voluntarily leave this, this job no. that they have. We have well, lots of people. You keep telling people that one of us has to die if somebody gets drunk. Somebody <laughs> might try to kill us. Yes, that's right. I, I've made that mistake. No. I said, you know, because we have lots of people that come here and say, hey, can can I have a job? Well, there's not any more room in the RV, and there's really nothing else for people to do. Yeah. Maybe once we get our store and we would have an outreach vehicle, then we could have some more yeah. positions available. But I have said that uh, these guys aren't aren't going to leave until they die. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Or until we get a proper license, and then you're not going to leave either. But no. uh, you know, we're going to be more happy. And these are going to be my friends for the rest of my be life. More That's, balanced, That's what right? I know. Once we get the, once you get things together, it's been a fun it's been a fun time. It's great. We are family. That's for sure. <laughs> we are. And, uh, it's great. We love what we're doing. We love that we're giving back. We love that we're making a difference. And uh, I highly recommend that uh, you do that as well in some form or fashion. Uh, making a difference in this world, especially the, the shape this world is in, is really, really important. Uh, it's never been more important for people to get involved in local politics, to get involved in, in volunteering at different places. And uh, as far as we're concerned, uh, for people to continue yeah, to uh, work hard towards convincing the people in positions of power that poor people and sick people and everybody, ordinary people, deserve to have easy access to cannabis, low barrier access, which we absolutely do not have with legalization. Legalization maintained prohibition prices, it main, maintained prohibition activities. Uh, it simply uh, included a new gang into the mix, the government gang of corporate rich people who want to uh, use their muscle, just like all the other <coughs> gangs use muscle to try to enforce their territory. That's what our government is doing with all of their, their cannabis corporate greedy bastards. And uh, the difference is, is that they use our money to run their protection racket as opposed to these other gangs, which at least they're spending their own money to protect their turf. So uh, it really does bother me a lot that uh, this is the situation that we're in and uh, we're going to try to solve this. So I, I recommend you do what you can. 
uh, find a way. Keep watching this show, and thank you to everybody that's watching this show. I appreciate you all so much. It's very, very valuable that I continue to get this message out to people and to further it to other people. And uh, to all the people that have helped us, the, the donators that are helping Mary in London, and Chris in Halifax, and Jason in Sudbury, and anybody else that's helping anywhere else, this program, those programs are all done strictly by volunteers and all by donation. There is no, nobody with deep pockets, there is no funding, there is there's no grants going on. Um, they're just volunteers, just good people that care, that uh, want to make a difference. And, uh, and the donators, the people that are helping with the products that are, are provided are so invaluable, are so wonderful. Uh, I can't thank you all. And so, um, Everybody out there, thank you for watching. Thank you for being a part of things. Continue to watch Pot TV. Uh, I'm here every Tuesday, come rain or shine, it seems. And uh, we have other shows as well. On Monday, it's the 420 Lifestyle Show with Carly Marley and BC Bud Girl. On Thursdays, it's BC Bud Girl again with uh, Wake and Bake Show Morning Glory, 10 a.m. On Friday, one of the most important shows is Johnny B with How's It Growing? Because Growing cannabis is the one thing that, that a lot of people can do that can't do anything else. They can grow some cannabis. So therefore, they can avoid going to the government stores or they can share it with their friends and have those people not have to go to government stores. Putting enough cannabis in the marketplace that we don't need to go to government stores is a real thing that we need to be doing. So everybody, if you can go, grow. And there again, just like activism uh, being a very valuable thing to do for yourself as well as for the world, growing cannabis is an amazingly beneficial thing to do for yourself. Um, it's very therapeutic if you're if you're a person that's not well and you have, have at least the ability to grow. Growing your own medicine is a very therapeutic thing to do. It's therapeutic anyway. It's it's really cool to watch. Uh, things grow the way that cannabis grows. It grows quite well. You've seen the plant in the shop that every week it's considerably bigger than the week before. And uh, not only that, it's economically uh, beneficial to people that are purchasing their cannabis, be it from, well, not government stores, but from whoever. And, and, and that's a big help too. As long as the price of cannabis is way the heck up there, you can grow yourself a whole lot of money by growing cannabis. So check out Johnny B on Fridays with How's It Growing and lots and lots of shows in the archives. You could spend a long time going through the archives and getting up to date on lots of things and getting educated about lots of things. I highly recommend you do that. A big thank you from me to Cannabis Culture for giving me that, this platform to be able to do this from, to my producer Anil for all of his hard work in making this happen. And again, to all of you people who watch, I can't thank you enough. I love you all. I hope that you uh, do well in your lives and that uh, you're kind to yourself and kind to others. And as you go about it all, you know it. Have as much fun as you can. Okay.